Welcome to War Games, hosted by the sales genius Joe Ingram. If you're looking to win the sales battle, then you have joined the right team. In the War Games group, we devise strategies for sales, marketing, branding, mindset, and attitude. We enlist the assistance from the most successful producers across all industries. We then share their knowledge and techniques with you. Our single goal is to get you ready for your next sales opportunity. When it comes to crossing the minefield of sales, step in the footprints of those that have crossed before you. Now, prepare yourself for boot camp and beyond. It's time for the war games to begin. Hello, war gamers, and those of you listening on the Sales Genius Podcast. I'm going to throw up a little sound effect here that I built up for the sales genius team. That's going to be over on the other side of the thing, but no, it needs to be unfiltered. So we need to talk about sales. Let's talk about sales, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the challenges that may be. Let's talk about sales a little bit, a little bit. Let's talk about sales. All right. That was me having fun with all my friends out on Fiverr to get that done. So let me throw up a couple of VIPs before we bring up our guests. We have Natalie Essman. Netta Ingram is over here. I know you guys are expecting Brian Galke, but he's at a live event today, so he he won't be joining us. But we're going to be here, sitting over here. Let's go ahead and change everything around. Fantastic. All right. So today, what do we got going on today? Okay. So... This is going to be one of those episodes that you're going to be like, dang, this was what I needed to hear, but I kept refusing. Okay. And it's going to be something you're going to sit back and go, okay, so I'm going to talk to you right now. So if you're looking at this, I've got Jonathan coming on. Jonathan has an extensive career in sales. His expertise in sales itself is is a testament to his commitment to the art of selling. Okay. He has co-founded a company called The Practice Lab. So you guys may be understanding what it is he's going to tell you you got to do today just by the name of the company. Okay. But he introduces sales teams to techniques that are typically associated to professional athletes or musicians, and they use those techniques to sharpen their skills. So he's pulling it across into a different platform for those of us in sales, because let's be real, we're all in sales. So he's going to be helping us to elevate our sales techniques, and we're going to talk to him. He's from Colorado, a seasoned sales professional, and he has a very innovative way of doing the stuff that we have done before, but we're going to add a little bit of flavor, and that flavor is Jonathan Mahan. Jonathan, welcome. I'm bringing you over. I'm going to say switch with me because it's about you today, right? And there we go. So we got Jonathan. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on, Joe. Looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now what you guys can expect, and this is what it was. Um, Reached out to Jonathan on LinkedIn. He came back, says, hey, this sounds great. And he immediately took the step to go say, book a book a time. Then he came back and said, am I really the right person for your group? So then we set up a separate meeting and went back. So he cares, right? He said, I don't want to come on here and not be able to drop value. And that to me, there was a lot of respect for that, Jonathan. And we sat down and talked and I was like, oh yeah, they need this and they'll get the value from it. <laughs> so he said, okay, I will be playing it right here, right now. So Jonathan, welcome. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. And for those <laughs> puzzling and wondering about that, um, the reason I said I wasn't sure if I'd be the right guest is that most of the work I do is with like B2B teams selling tech, right? Whether that's, you know, hardware technology or in most cases, software, sometimes services. Um, but it's really for, for sales teams what I spend most of my time doing. Um, and I used to sell in other contexts and I've even like, you know, uh, helped and coach sellers who sell more in the B2C world. And I know it's a little bit of a different selling motion. So I actually ran everything I'm going to share today by Joe first, just to make sure that this would apply to the world of those of you who are working, you know, more directly with consumers rather than selling to other businesses. But uh, he assures me it's all applicable. We, we cleared that. And, and Joe, you can probably even help as we go, kind of drawing the parallels for people as we go through this. Absolutely. I very seldom stay quiet 
And that is smart too much on that one. Yeah. So where should we where should we start, Joe? It's your show. What do you well, want to dive into well, first? Give me give me a little bit of your history, like what it is that you did, and then how did you jump to say, I, I'm going to go start practice lab, and what was the motivation behind it, and then give us two three t- tips that we could use so that we can go out and sell more, like we had talked about before this. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess by way of quick background, so I started off my sales career doing door to door sales. Um, then I moved into retail sales, worked in like cell phone stores for a couple of years, um, selling to you know individuals there. Um, and then I moved into technology sales where I sold software and services and stuff of that nature for about five years. And as I moved on in my career, I started to realize something really frustrating was happening. And that was that I would read a sales book. I'd read a LinkedIn post, I'd listen to a podcast, and I would have my eyes opened to a newer, better, different way of selling. And I'd be like, that's it. No, that's what I want to do. That's the way I want to sell. That's genius. And then I would all excitedly go on to my next call. And damn it, in the moment, under pressure, got a customer in front of me. I couldn't think of any of those things that I had just learned. And I felt like the only option I had was just to like, you know, go back to my defaults and just do what I'd always done and sell the way I'd always sold. And this kept happening. It was getting frustrated, right? It felt like 1% of what I was learning was actually showing up in my sales calls. And I realized that I couldn't be the seller that I wanted to be if only 1% of what I was learning was making it into my real calls. So I started doing some Googling and researching and reading books and listening to podcasts on the topic of skill development and behavior change, trying to figure out how these amazing performers in other disciplines, right? Comedians and actors and chess players and musicians and, you know, uh, sports teams, how do they take all the theory they've learned and turn it into something they can regularly, repeatedly do under pressure come performance time? And what I found was that almost everywhere I looked, every researcher who had studied it, every book been written, seemed to settle on the same conclusion. It's practice that does it, but not just any old repetition, not just any old practice, really a focused kind of practice that these researchers called deliberate practice, which really takes all of like the fluffy moments from normal practice, cuts them out and just hones in on the the real learning moments and those real skill growth moments. And that's what I realized these other disciplines did. And that's what I realized I needed myself. So the earliest roots of the practice lab were when I was just still a regular individual contributor. I was an account executive, you know, selling cybersecurity software to businesses. And I realized that I needed these skills. I needed this practice. So I started doing these like impromptu meetups with my colleagues where we'd meet up once a week and do some practice. And I was experimenting with taking these concepts I was learning about deliberate practice from other disciplines and experimenting with bringing them into the world of sales and what we have to do. So one thing led to another. I ended up bringing on a co-founder who was a sales trainer and she really amped things up quite a bit for us. And eventually we started charging for it. And then one thing led to another and we, you know, quit, cut off our W-2s and went full time uh, just doing this work for ourselves. But it's been a hell of a ride and just really fascinating to, again, take something that's been so well documented up in other disciplines and try to find a way to bring it into the world of sales. It's been quite interesting for me. Well, I can't hear you, Joe. I don't know if it's just me or, <laughs> or if you're it, it might just be that I was muted. That yes. would do it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Netta has that button, so she always hits that button to mute me. But um, so in looking at it, it, I wrote it down, but now I want to get your definition. What is the definition of deliberate practice? Because you yeah. said cut out stuff, but some people sitting there going, what stuff am I cutting out? What is it that I'm looking at? What what would you say was I sat down with my group of guys, we pull, pulled everybody together and we had a meetup and we said deliberate practice. What does that look like as far as for those of us that are trying to write down the process? Kind of yeah, thing? I think the, the easiest way to understand it is almost to start with what it's not and then figure out what's wrong with what it's not and then work our way into what it does look like. So imagine you're a sports team. You show up to practice and the coach says, hey, welcome to practice, folks. Uh, those of you on this side of the room, you're team A. Uh, those of you on this side of the room, you're team B. Uh, go play some football. They do that for 90 minutes and they say, great work, everyone. Go rest up. I'll see you again tomorrow. We'll do the same thing tomorrow. It's not how teams practice, is it? Right. And if they did, it wouldn't really get any better. It's similar in most traditional sales role plays where they say, all right, you're the buyer. You're the customer. Uh, hit him with an objection and do your best to respond. Great work. Who's next? Because what you're doing in either of those cases, all you're doing is taking whatever your current way of doing things is, and you're doing it that way again, which all it really does is make more permanent whatever your current way of doing things is. And something that's really, really important to realize is that repetition alone doesn't actually grow skill. All repetition does is solidify whatever your current level of skill is. A good example of this is 
imagine, think of someone who's driving every day to work, right? They must rack up a lot of hours driving. I think most people, I Googled it, and most people by age like 65 have gotten that 10,000 hours number that's supposed to make you an expert of driving. Mm -hmm. And yet most people who are 65 are not in fact expert drivers despite their 10,000 hours. It's because simple repetition doesn't make you any better. It just solidifies your current best. So regular practice, ineffective practice is simple repetition where you just take your thing that you do and you just do it again. And there's really no benefit to doing that. And it's no benefit to doing that in this environment compared to doing that in front of a customer, which a lot of people, when they think of role play, that's all it's been. And that's why they say it was an awkward, uncomfortable waste of time. And it probably was. So for deliberate practice, the idea of deliberate practice is that you're not just taking your current way of doing things and doing it again, you're actually introducing a new way of doing things to the equation. So there's the first differentiating point. With deliberate practice, you're very clear going into it what good looks like. What am I aiming for here? What am I trying to do? And in most cases, it's something that is in some ways different or better than the way you currently do it. So that's point number one, deliberate practice, clarity going into it, what good looks like. The other piece that's important here is that in order for your brain to really make different choices and handle a situation differently, it can really only focus on one small piece at a time. Another element of deliberate practice, it's chunked down into pieces and you just focus on one part at a time. Compare that to maybe more traditional sales training where you sit there for an, for an hour, you listen to a sales trainer tell you 12 different points about what makes for a good discovery call. And then they throw you into a mock discovery call and you have to try to implement all 12 of those points in this mock call. Forget right. it, your brain can't do that, right? Your brain's just gonna default to whatever it does normally, um, which again, isn't the point of practice. You want your brain doing things differently than it's used to, forging new paths that hasn't gone down before. So we have to break it down into small pieces and focus on one piece at a time. So sometimes this means you're focusing on just an individual moment and you just practice that moment over and over again. Sometimes you might play out a longer call, but you're just focusing on one aspect of your communication. For example, maybe on one role play, all you focus on is your body language and nobody cares what you say. It's all about how you're carrying yourself. And then on the next role play, it switches. We don't care about your body language. Now we just care about the words you use. Or maybe we just care about the tone. Or maybe another role play, we don't even care about any of that. All we care about is your ability as a seller to read the other person's face, engage their emotions as you go through your presentation. Maybe that's what we're focusing on. So it's just picking one piece at a time and focusing on either that skill or sometimes just focusing on one moment and making sure you nail that one moment. So that's not that I'm on deliberate practice. That's gotta be chunked down into small pieces. No, the other thing that's, oh, that. I'm cut in here. I'm doing a lot of talking. No, no, I'm just, I'm just saying right now it's because, okay. So as a sales trainer myself, right. You have to sit back. Like I will do, here's the six steps to this activity. Right. And then I will spend, you know, 20 minutes on the first sentence of step one, right. Trying to get everybody to understand it and going through and what have you, where most people are like, just tell them to read it. I'm like, but you got to make sure everybody understands everything. So what I love is the fact that, right. The answer is don't read it out loud, read it to yourself. Now let's watch your face. Okay. What is your face telling me? Right. To me, that's when I look at it, that's the most amazing thing because truly I could sit in front of a mirror right now and I could practice something and see what my face looked like. What was it that I said and see, can I maneuver my face differently to see if I what what makes me feel like as I'm going through something, yeah. but no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love the fact that you you did this and I wrote down um, listening to you. Uh, you're going to devolve to the most repetition. So when you get into something right there, you're going to go, okay, what are you going to do? Well, I'm trying to evolve your sales skills, and then what happens is we put you under pressure and you devolve to whatever was the most repetitious piece that you that you've done an, over and over again and that just to me it was a great way of throwing it down because it was like oh everybody will understand what that meant <laughs> so yeah i wish i wish i remember the exact phrase but it's a phrase i think that originally was born in the military of like you don't rise to the level of your knowledge you fall to the level of your preparation or your training yeah but that's very true like in the human brain under moments of emotion and stress and tension the brain can't really access everything it knows a lot of what's stored in the brain just kind of shuts down goes dark and isn't available to you in those high stress moments all that's available to you in those high stress moments are those most deeply dug grooves in your brain those things you've done over and over and over again those are available to you but all that new stuff that the sales trainer just layered in on the top that's usually not available in the moment so you can't access it and you can't use it 
So a couple more points on deliberate practice, then we can probably move on to another topic. Um, or, or, uh, yeah. After you've charmed it down, a really important element of the practice is that you practice an environment where the expectation is not for you to perform, not for you to prove how good you are, not for you to get certified, not for you to impress someone. Rather, you need to be practicing an environment where the expectation is that you're going to stumble, make a mistake, have to slow down, rewind the tape, try that again. And this is really important because the brain really has two modes it can operate in, right? One is the performance mode, one is the improvement mode. When you're in the performance mode, all the brain cares about is doing the very best you can count on yourself to be able to do in this moment. Which by the way, for most people, the best thing they can count on themselves to do reliably is the thing that, is the thing that they've done a hundred times already, right? That's the thing they can turn to reliably. So if you put someone in the improvement in the performance zone rather, and their goal is just to do the best they can on this attempt, they'll default to what's most familiar to them because that generally is the best thing they can do on this attempt. Which again, you get into that trap of just making more permanent whatever their current best is, which isn't what you want. In the improvement zone, the brain has the flexibility to not make this their best attempt ever. The purpose in the improvement zone is to try to do things differently than they've done before. Try to be more aware than you've been before. Try to take a different course than you've gone on before. And by definition, when you're trying something new, that's typically when you stumble and mess up and make a mistake and have to back up and try it again. So if you put people in an environment where the practice is positioned as a certification or a test, again, you're going to be in that trap where people just do whatever their current best is, and it just becomes more permanent. So you need to create the environment of, listen, folks, the purpose today is to push ourselves to the edge of our abilities. I'm expecting you guys to have to pause, to blank, to say something and go, ooh, that didn't sound right, and back up and correct it. I'm expecting that. That's okay. That allows people to shift into that improvement zone. That allows them to start thinking differently than what they've thought before. It gives them the freedom to like slow down if they need to, rather than having to like practice it at game speed, which again is part of the process of digging a new groove in the brain, a new pattern to follow, rather than just reinforcing the old one. And then the final point for deliberate practice is that with deliberate practice, the feedback piece happens in the middle, not at the end. Again, most typical role plays, either there's no feedback or if there is feedback, it's like, hey, great job. Here's a few things I noticed. Boom, 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 boom. All right, great job. Next person. And what is the rep really supposed to do with that laundry list of information about things they should do different next time? What are the odds anything actually changes when the next attempt appears? So in deliberate practice, you do an attempt, you get a few items of feedback, preferably just one item of feedback about what to do differently next time. And then you immediately do it differently next time trying to implement that feedback. And in that moment, when you did it one way, wasn't great, got some feedback, did it a slightly different way, felt, ooh, yeah, that did feel better. That's the moment where your brain really grew skill. That's the moment where your brain took the theory and figured out how to translate that into action, right? It took that theory it learned and figured out what it feels like to do that theory in the real world. And that's something your brain can hold on to. And that's something your brain can use. So feedback's got to go in the middle when it's deliberate practice. And you have these multiple attempts back to back with one little bit of feedback in between each attempt. So you keep improving a little piece at a time. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And the, it makes more sense because I'm sitting now going, great, this will instantly change what happens when I walk across the hall, right? To go do something <laughs> and go, okay, guys, look, this is what we need to do. But each and every person who's watching and going through this you should take it as a personal mission the next time you're practicing with people to incorporate this. It doesn't have to be you teaching, but at the same time, I think, you know, one of the big ahas for me was the, the brain is either in performance or improvement mode. And yeah. so if you can foster that, right. I, I put down, cause I like to play with words, right. I said, you got to chunk it down, but then you have to create an arena of mistakes. Right. Mm -hmm. So we bring everybody into the arena and say, come on, screw it up. Let's yeah. screw it up. It's OK. Let's go in here and make sure everybody understands that, you know, it's OK to make that mistake. And I think right there, the pressure comes off. And I think it'd be a lot easier to take that feedback in the middle when you're not in the performance mode of perfection. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> And he didn't go over this on the call we had before. That's why I'm writing feverishly over here. So, oh, yes, I need to know that. I need to know that. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so we, we've now got our point of understanding. And I don't want you to give away the whole company. Right? <laughs> we understand we have deliberate practice. So you took that and said, okay, so if you went back to 
in the sports analogy, right? For some reason, your football team was indoors. I don't understand. No. Right. <laughs> they were on one wall. The other one was on another wall. Yeah. So um, in the room. But when you look at it, what I was thinking was, again, what happens when you got a guy whose job is to only kick? Right. They're not telling him go run up and down and go do push ups. Go do that. They're like, go out there and kick and kick and kick. Move the ball to this side. Move it over to here and kick. They're not telling him to go practice all the other stuff. And so if somebody's going to be doing their job in in sports and in music, you're not going to go take the guy who plays the guitar and tell him he has to go learn the drums to practice. Right. Your job is go and play these 10 songs. Right. And then when you listen and go, you mess up every time right here. Let's just practice that spot. Let's just practice that spot. But I don't believe most people and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jonathan, but most people don't listen through all the practice for somebody else with the intent of trying to help them. They're they're still in performance. So they're thinking, well, at least I didn't screw it up as bad as Natalie just did. OK, mm -hmm. good. Now I just know I got to be better when it comes through to me. Right. And so, and yeah. again, that, and that's, that's, that's the environment. Yeah. And when, when that dynamic is a play on a call, you know, people are in the performance zone. And again, all you're doing at that point is just forcing them to make more permanent, whatever their current best is. And generally that's not what people need, right? They don't need help be more permanent. So, so does this apply to the perfect practice makes perfect? I would say so. Yeah. There's a variety of different slogans, right? Perfect practice yeah. makes perfect. Or some people say practice makes permanent or, Perfect practice executed perfectly makes perfect performance. I don't know. This is a bunch of slogans like that. Yeah. But yeah, that's the idea. All practice isn't created equal. And just simple repetition does not mean the same as focused, deliberate practice. So so I want to I want to pick your brain on this other subject, right? So on the deliberate practice and bringing it in, give me an example of how you would kick off the fact that we're about to do deliberate practice so that people would understand because you had to reach out to these people and go hey let's do a little meetup talk about practice and they're like shut up mm -hmm. talk about practice what are you doing you had to go in there and go hey here's something i'm I want, i'm entertaining this and that so if you if i gave you five guys and said here because i'm assuming at the practice lab you would teach us how to practice correctly right what's what's the actual this is what i say to a group before i start it so that everybody knows that we should be in improvement mode, not performance mode. Yeah. So. Hmm. One thing that we found can be helpful is a lot of times when you just use the word practice, what pops into people's mind is like that shitty, awkward role play their first sales manager did that was really uncomfortable and didn't feel like it helped at all. And that's what people think of when you say practice, right? And clearly people are like, no, thanks. I don't want to do that. I would, I would, once was enough. I don't ever want to do right. that again. So a lot of times we will use language of like, you know, growing skill, using some of the same techniques that athletes and musicians use to grow skill. Okay. And then only then say deliberate practice, but usually that's enough to pique people's interest and get them to go, tell me more, right? And then we say, well, it's, you know, not just a shitty awkward role play. It's really, you know, using some of the principles that other disciplines use to grow skill in a hurry. Um, so that language can help. So, you know, if you're listening to this and you want to go talk to your, you know, three or four colleagues that you work with, and you're not sure how to talk to them about it because you don't want them to think it's role play. That could be a talk track to use. Um, but as far as like how to set the tone for that improvement zone, we're actually just really, really upfront and direct about that. So when we're in the session, before we even start practicing, we'll tell people, hey, by the way, we're going to be doing practice here for the moment. But the purpose of this practice is not to show off to your partner how smooth you are or how quickly you can get it or how quickly you can do the right thing to say. That actually doesn't help you grow any skill at all. Rather, imagine, and we'll paint the picture of like a musician learning a new piece of music. Right. They're not going to rush through the entire song at game speed beginning to end, or I guess at you know, music speed, whatever, uh, at beginning to end. They're just not. They're going to start with one piece, fill it out, try it. If something doesn't feel right, they'll back up, try it a few more times until it feels right, and then move on to the next piece. And we paint that picture for them and say, that's actually the kind of practice that science shows the most effective. And we'll even close that bit out by saying, this is your official invitation to not be smooth, to not be polished, to make mistakes, to double back and make corrections if it doesn't feel right. That's what shows that you're at the edge of your abilities and the edge of your abilities is the best place you can be. So like, we'll just, we, 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 uh, we don't mince words about it. We're very direct about the purpose of the practice. And again, the signs that you're doing it right. And a little bit of stumbling and making mistakes are signs that you do it right. And we keep reiterating that. So typically when we work with teams, you know, we'll work with them for, you know, each week for a couple of months. Um, but we'll, 
I would say every other week, if not every week, we weave that bit in, even if in the more summarized version. But like we keep reminding people, again, folks, we're not expecting you to be perfect here. If you're making mistakes, that's a good sign. And we just keep bringing that up. We just did a session where like, we've been working with the team for three straight months. And in this session, this was our last session with them. And we still reminded them in that last session, you don't need to be perfect. Because again, it's really important that you keep reminding people of that um, so they don't slip into that you know, performance zone. So you can just be very direct when you're, uh, when you're setting the stage there. Fantastic. I just put this into the comments on StreamYard to put out there. But the edge of your abilities is where you want to be. Yeah. So you said that, and I mean, it just rattled in my head to say, okay, I want to be on the edge of my ability, not rest back and say, well, I know I got this. I and got again, this. I, I want to keep going and going. Now I'm right here at the edge of where I was before, and now I'm absolutely growing moving forward. And if you're kicking ass and taking names through the whole exercise, that means you're not actually at the edge of your abilities and you're not actually benefiting from this practice as much as you could be. When you stumble, mess up, have to pause, have to back up, try again, that's the sign that you're at the edge of your abilities. And that's the sign that you're doing like the best practice you could be doing right now. Fantastic. No, that's amazing. That is amazing. Natalie, any questions? Because I just noticed we're creeping up on the 2.30 mark right now. So I was like, dang, this yes. flew. <laughs> yes. First, I just want to say I love everything about what you're doing. It just makes so much sense to me. And I just love just everything about it on so many different levels. But so my question is, I guess what I'm a little confused on is, um, do you have a, like a brick and mortar? Let's just say I'm someone that's you know looking to get into entrepreneurship. I've just started. I know I got to work on my sales skills. Can I just call up a, the local practice lab in my area and just be like, hey, I'm looking for an environment to grow and get better in, get my skin and show up there. And there's a group of people I work with. Or do you go into businesses and work with teams and that's or both? Yeah, good question. So we, we've done both throughout our history. Right now, we're focusing pretty heavily on teams and kind of running these practice sessions privately with teams. Um, we do actually have a monthly meetup called the Practice Club, which is more of kind of what you described. Of it's it's online. It's not brick and mortar, but it's just a mix of people across different industries and products who show up once a month to practice together. Um, so there is th that option for individuals for once a month practice. But for people wanting to do more of this practice thing, um, you know, you can do some of this on your own, right? Uh, you know, it's certainly taken us two years to really crack the code on the, the, the best practice. But truthfully, even the practice that I was doing like day one when we first started was still pretty good practice and it still helped. Right. <laughs> so um, a lot of people can do this on their own. I would say that two areas to look is one is to focus on moments in your sales process that carry like an outsized impact on how the conversation goes. So a lot of times how you open a call might be one of those moments. How you talk about your competitors might be one of those moments. How you talk about pricing might be one of those moments, but identify those moments that really carry a lot of weight in how the rest of the conversation goes and practice those moments. So figure out in advance, what does good look like here? It doesn't have to be a script, but just some guidelines on how you want to handle that. What are some points you want to hit? Then have a partner feed you the prompt, like how do you compare to a competitor? Or can you give me a discount? And then you practice your response to that prompt. So that's one way of doing it is like individual moments. The other thing you think about, though, is like foundational skills, brain abilities, things that your brain can pull off under pressure that maybe are a little hard to do now. So a lot of those foundational brain abilities that you need as a seller are really just foundational like communication skills and human skills. But they're really, really powerful. And again, reading a book about how important these skills are doesn't actually rewire your brain to have these skills. So, for example, like I think you can use the example earlier of like reading someone's body language. We all know reading body language is important. You can read a book on body language, but in the moment when you're presenting your stuff, it's actually really hard for your brain to simultaneously be thinking about what you're presenting and what you're saying while also keeping a channel open to monitor their body language and their facial features. That's a hard skill to have. Or listening, right? We all know listening is really important, but that's actually a very difficult skill, especially in a sales call when you're got one eye on the clock, seeing where the time is, and you got part of your brain thinking about what do you want to cover on this call, and part of your brain thinking about the next question you want to, want to ask, and suddenly you're realizing, oh, shit, I haven't been paying very much attention to what they've been saying, except other than just the surface level. So it's actually like really deep listening, where again, you don't just notice what they're saying, but you like really interpret what they're saying and notice the gaps in their narrative and get curious about things and pick up emotional cues. That kind of deep listening is actually really hard for the brain to do, especially when it's also worried about other things in the sales call. 
So that's another kind of like foundational skill you could practice. And what's nice about these foundational skills is you don't actually have to role play anything to practice them. Because these are just human skills, communication skills, they're people skills. You can practice these skills in contexts and settings outside of sales. So you can go talk to your neighbor and make it a challenge for yourself as you're talking to them to make note of their facial features and what emotions they're probably feeling in the moment. You're growing your skill in that moment, right? Maybe you need to just grow your skill of like curiosity. So similarly, you in the next family gathering, walk up to that one brother-in-law who you generally don't even really talk to and you don't even really know him that well and start asking them questions and try to get curious about their world and get curious about what interests them, their motivations and all the, you know, what kind of person they are and ask questions and just train your brain to get more curious. I'll tell you, Joe, one of the best, and you've probably experienced this yourself, one of the very best things I ever did that very quickly made me a better seller. So I started my own podcast because when you're a podcast host, you have to use a lot of those same kind of muscles, so to speak, those same skills of like listening to your guest and what they're saying, picking up on what they're not saying. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Planning out what you want to touch on in the episode, yep. sticking to a plan, but still being flexible. Like a lot of the same mental gymnastics a seller has to do in a discovery call, a podcast host has to do in a podcast conversation. So you can become a better seller by hosting a podcast. So that's the other thing I would suggest is outside of just identifying individual moments and role playing those moments. You can identify foundational skills and try to think about real life conversations you can have that'll grow those same skills. No. What are you going to say now, Natalie? <laughs> just handed it all right over to you. It was there. That was excellent. Thank you. <laughs> really good stuff. No, absolutely. I love it. So again, like um, I was commenting to my buddy, George, um, that was in the thing he popped up said this is george for you right here what's up brother <laughs> yeah so um what i told him was so he he runs a, a large dealership and i was telling him this should be up on your conference room every week you should have this up here but you know he's part of the group which means he can go back in and play this again but looking at it right now how much would his role play change with his sales managers and everybody else that's sitting back going, oh, let's only break it down to this piece and make it okay for everybody to screw up in that process. Because again, like you were saying before, all the shitty role play that I do with my manager. Well, your manager already has it deeply grooved. So it's smoother for him. Right. And now we turn around and go, oh, by the way, now I'm going to tell you, hey, um, go do it. And you're not as good as me. That's pretty much what role play comes down to, right? And they're going, they're going, yep, you still suck. Yep, you still suck. You still suck, <laughs> right? And again, and I'm list, I'm looking at all this going, chunk it down, right? Chunk it down, make sure it's okay to, to mess up. But it helped me to realize how much smoother I have to deliver that to the people I train. Because every day I am literally training people. But to sit back and go through, I, I, I start off and I tell them, look, this you're reading this right now. It's not going to sound perfect. It's not going to be that. But I know they're still in performance mode. And so getting them to understand it's improvement mode, right? And I'm like, great, I'm going to go make a sign that says, in here we approve. And I'll slap it on the wall on every time I call somebody into go training and go, hey, look, we're in this improvement space right now. I don't need perfection, right? Because if you get perfect at it, then we're just going to add one more piece and, and keep going. So... But that's it, man. That's absolutely <laughs> true. So, but no, I thank you so much. That it, it's been again. I laugh and say thirty years in the business, right? Doing this, and I've, I'm learning it every every week. I get to learn something new, and it's a very selfish passion of mine to put out mm -hmm. the the actual <laughs> podcast because I get to have all these people like yourself that come in, right? Care about an outcome and share it with other people. So people can find you at thepracticelab.co. That's correct down there. Is that okay yeah, for them definitely. to do? Yeah, practicelab.co. Find them in LinkedIn too. So. LinkedIn as well. For those of you who are, you know, individuals um, looking to get some practice for yourself, that practice club meetup that I briefly mentioned earlier, that's actually something we do for free. Um, so you can come and, again, practice with a group of peers for an hour each month at no cost. So if you want to sign up for that, that is the practice lab.co slash club. 
and that'll get you to a role in the practice club. We rotate through a handful of different topics that you know are kind of universal to all salespeople, from you know controlling your tone of voice and your nonverbal communication to presenting features in a way that really resonates and excites people, and even like talking about like late stage stuff that happens around like objections and you know trying to trying to save the deal that's about to go south. Um, so again, was it practice lab dot club or dot co slash club? Second one, .co slash club. If you just go to the practice lab.co, you'll see like a banner for it anyways, and we'll get you there. But yeah, so that's for individuals. If you do actually have a team of salespeople and you want them practicing your skills too, uh, you can just email us, hello at the practice lab.co. Uh, let us know you heard us you know, on more games and we can talk about some of the services we offer. We even have a handful of like free resources as well that you can get started with just to dabble your toe in the water of practice before you know diving in with both feet. Um, but just email us hello at the practice lab.co if you lead a team and we can share the free resources we got. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So that's great. I love this part. Now, so is it virtual meetups or are you doing in city? So so right now it's all virtual, all through Zoom. Thank you, thank you. I yeah. like that. Tom Bosick, thank you so much for typing it in for me. Beautiful. <laughs> he realized I was typing way too slow to put it on the banner. So now it's there for it. But that's great. So um, Natalie said she'll be online at the next meetup. <laughs> I just committed her. But, yeah. we'll, we'll spotlight her for the group and make her practice forever. Right. We'll, we'll put her in the performance zone. <laughs> right. Go ahead now. Practice this and you've never heard it. Yeah. <laughs> so. But no, that's fantastic because Natalie sells a service, right? She has products, but the, the best product she has is her, right? Delivering the, the products to people. So I think that would be great. No, I love it. I'm going to put this up in War Games group so people can click on it and end up over there and sign up for the, the role play done right with your deliberate practice. Yes, so that makes perfect sense. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I appreciate you. Everybody, again, you've got the website scrolling across the bottom and in the comments on multiple platforms. And you can find him on LinkedIn, as I did. He has a bright yellow page. So speaking That's happy it. sunshine stuff. <laughs> That's real fine. Me. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan. Natalie, thanks for joining us. Netta, who was here earlier. But uh, appreciate all of you that are here. I will end up on the Sales Genius Podcast. Thank you, Jonathan. Everybody else, go out and sell something.